Okay, I think we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome this morning's uh, seminar speaker, Dr. Babak Marara from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Marara got his MD at Columbia University and then did surgery residency, plastic surgery residency, and craniofacial research fellowship at NYU. Then he went briefly to UCLA for a microsurgery fellowship, and then in 2002, he was recruited as an assistant member at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And since then, he's risen up through the ranks, and he's currently a member with tenure, an adjunct professor at Cornell, and is the chief of plastic and reconstructive, reconstructive surgery service at Sloan Kettering. Um, his specialization is in cancer reconstruction, and his clinical research is on lymphedema, which is a significant and growing problem in cancer survivors. Um, he also runs a NIH-funded basic research lab where he developed a mouse model of lymphedema. And his basic and clinical research together have really suggested um, a, a new view on how we look at lymphedema. So um, his work um, now has invited us to see lymphedema as a fundamentally immunological process that results in fibrotic disease and impaired lymphatic function rather than uh, a plumbing problem that leads to swelling. Um, and of course, as you might imagine, this is generating novel ideas uh, for therapies for this very important problem. So Babak, it's a pleasure to have you in Minnesota, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I have to tell you, it's, it's a little intimidating for me to um, give this talk in front of a group of immunologists uh, and, you know, as a surgeon. And, and so I'm not going to try and dazzle you with our science. I'm just going to take you to the story of how I got interested in this and what we've done in the last 10 years or so um, to try and come up with better, better treatments. So imagine being cured of breast cancer, and then you're oncologist tells you that you now have this lifelong progressive disease due to your treatment that causes swelling in your arm. Um, he says that, um, you know, you have basically swelling and tightness in your arm, your fingers are swollen, you can't wear your wedding ring, and there's really not much we can do about it. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of shots. Yeah, that's better. And, and then they tell you that this is uh, state-of-the-art therapy. Um, you have to see a therapist two or three times a week. It takes a long time. You have to wear these tight, uncomfortable garments pretty much 24-7, or your arm will swell up. Um, never mind that these garments are really hot and uncomfortable. They sometimes gather you know, inappropriate attention. Um, they're not covered by insurance. Um, they remind you of your breast cancer diagnosis every day when you wear them. And when I was in med school, they didn't teach us about lymphedema. Uh, so I was really shocked when I started my practice, when I walked in the clinic and I would see one, two, or three, or four patients with lymphedema every day. Um, a lot of patients with breast cancer, because of course breast cancer is very common, but also patients with lower extremity edema and lymphedema in other areas from other cancers. And, and about one in three patients who has an axillary lymph node dissection for breast cancer goes on to develop lymphedema. But as I said, Lymphedema is not a breast cancer disease only. It's a, it's a disease of all solid tumors. Uh, basically, one in six patients who has any solid tumor goes on to develop lymphedema. And, and most common, the ones that I see are urologic um, melanomas, uh, gynecologic tumors, and sarcomas. Uh, these all have uh, problems with lymphedema. In fact, lymphedema is the most common long-term complication of cancer therapy. It's more common than uh, myelodysplasia or other problems related to chemotherapy, and it's more common than problems related to long-term problems related to radiation. There's about five, five million patients in America who have lymphedema, and, and I'm just going to try and put that into perspective for you. That's actually more patients than uh, with ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, Parkinson's and ALS put together. It's a pretty big deal. It's almost double the number of patients who have glaucoma. And there's just as many patients with lymphedema as there are with Alzheimer's. So it's a really big problem that I think is underappreciated and probably underfunded. Um, 
I don't know what the reason for that is, uh, but to date, you know, I think our uh, expenditure in research and work to improve lymphedemic care has really not kept up with these other diseases. So there I was in 2007. Um, Vladimir Putin was, uh, was the person of the year. Uh, Donald Trump was still, a, was still just a, uh, uh, a reality star, and OJ was on trial again. And I, I was just trying to figure out something that I can do um, that, that can make a difference. Um, we had just hired two people in our group, so I had a little bit more time uh, to do some work. And so I went and asked my boss at the time, Peter Scardino, um, to give me some time in the lab and to give me a little bit of space. And, and fortunately, I was able to convince him of that, and he gave me a bench in one of our senior members' um, uh, labs, and I was able to block out all the Fridays for the next year. I dealt with all the, the, all the complaints from the referring surgeons because they couldn't get their cases on on Fridays anymore. And, and basically, I committed myself to learn everything I know uh, about lymphedema and about the lymphatic system. And I had done a, a fellowship with this guy, Mike Longacre. Uh, basically, we learned a lot about bone tissue engineering and bone biology, but I really didn't know anything about the lymphatic system or the immune system. So it was all very new to me. Um, and then I, I figured out that the vast majority of the studies that had been done were really based on the concept of trying to make lymphatic vessels regenerate. Um, these studies, such as this one, um, used exogenous growth factors like VEGFC or these lymphangiogenic growth factors, trying to get the lymphatic vessels to reconnect. And that sort of makes intuitive sense because, you know, surgeons cut the lymphatic vessels. If we can get them to reconnect, then it's going to work better. And that, that all makes sense. But the problem with that is that VEGFC and all these other lymphangiogenic growth factors are also very potent mitogens for cancers. They actually make cancers grow. They make cancers metastasize. And because all my patients are cancer survivors, this is not an option for us. And so I couldn't really do that. It turns out that it's a little more complicated than that, but I'll get into that later. So we found some mouse models of lymphedema. Uh, this one had just come out, um, and funds were tight, uh, and you know I didn't have a lot of money or, or space, and so I decided that there's no real reason for us to have a, a larger animal model than mice were fine, and, and so we stuck with this. Um, this model was was actually very nice. It's it's really simple. You take out a little um, disc of skin circumferentially around the middle of the mouse tail. You remove the, um, the lymphatic vessels. Let's see if this pointer works. Anyway, maybe I can point to it from here. I can't. Anyway, you remove the lymphatic vessels. I show, I'm showing them to you with that red arrow. That, those are the deep collectors. Uh, we can identify them with uh, magnification and ligate them. And if you do that, these animals develop lymphedema that lasts about three or four months. Um, the control is if you just simply take out the skin and don't take out the deep lymphatics. Don't animals those animals get swelling that, that resolve. So we now had a model and system where we can compare chronic lymphedema versus acute sort of surgical lymphedema. And, and I started to think that maybe scarring or fibrosis is really the, the problem. Uh, scarring within the area of surgery is the problem that's causing this. Um, and, and, you know, this idea would explain some of the clinical factors for lymphedema. For example, you know, if it's just lymphatic injury, then, then why doesn't everyone get lymphedema? Uh, why is it just one in three? Um, if it's just lymphatic injury, then why does it take 10 months for patients to develop lymphedema? This, this graph shows you the incidence of lymphedema over time. And as you can see, very few people get lymphedema immediately after surgery. Most people get some swelling that resolves, and then eight or 10 months later, then they, they develop, develop uh, lymphedema. So it, it never really made sense to me that, that that happens. And if it was just lymphatic injury, then you would expect it to happen immediately after surgery and everyone would get it, but that's not, that's not what we saw. So um, I thought maybe this scarring, um, this abnormal scarring could explain that because, you know, let's say that one in three person uh, has a lot more scarring than the other two, and maybe that's why they get them. A time for enough scar to be laid down and not be functional. And, and, you know, we've published a couple of papers, and we t it turned out that there is a relationship between scarring and lymphatic regeneration, and we showed that if you decrease scar tissue formation across the wound with, you know, anti-scarring therapies, like, for example, in this case, we used monoclonal antibodies against TGF beta, that you can improve lymphedema in, in these mouse models. Um, and, and so maybe there was a relationship, but, but we really get, were not getting anywhere. Um, it, it was really difficult for us to 
differentiate between uh, lymphedema and the wound. Uh, and I show this picture just to sort of remind me of how painful that was because we were sort of looking right around the wound, uh, either distal to it, uh, distal to it is where the swelling is, or proximal to it where there's no swelling and thinking that there's going to be big differences. But there really wasn't, you know, the differences weren't very striking and it wasn't really that impressive. Uh, and, and we were having a really hard time trying to see differences that, were, that we thought were real. So we trudged along until about 2010. And my chairman, Scardino, uh, said, you know, maybe you could use a little mentorship in this. And um, I want you to meet this guy, Zvi Fuchs. He's right here. Uh, he's the head of uh, radiation oncology, and he happens to be a national science member. Pretty smart guy. Oh, and by the way, he's got a basal cell cancer uh, on his uh, eyelid that you need to take out. And <laughs> he's also on blood thinner, so don't screw it up. So. So as we walks in the office, uh, and uh, and I'm like, you know, what does a radiation oncologist know about lymphedema? I, I don't, I don't really need to hear from this guy. But he walks in the office, and he looks just like my dad. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> well, maybe this is a sign, you know. So we, we, I did Zvi surgery, and it went fine. And then uh, afterwards, he he was nice enough to meet with me for a little while, and I showed him our our studies and I talked to him about this idea of scar tissue which was kind of not really well formed at the time and he thought about it for a minute and he said you know you're doing it all wrong you're paying attention to the wrong spot don't look at the X that's where the wound is look distal and very proximal because that's where the problem is and that's where they're really different uh, and, and that actually really launched our lab that, that that insight that he had for me to go away from the wound uh, is really what made the difference so, uh, and, I, and I think in retrospect, you know, this was really pretty remarkable for a guy just hearing me for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, but let me just show you this picture, and this explains to you what, what I mean by that. So this is a, a, a normal patient's arm. Uh, we're doing uh, endocyanine green lymphangiography. Those are those two little needles. Uh, we inject this dye into the skin. Uh, the dye binds albumin. Because it binds albumin, it's only taken up by the lymphatics. And so we can visualize the lymphatics with a near-infrared camera, as you can see here. And the important thing here is uh, you can see the lymphatic vessels are, are straight linear lymphatic vessels, and there's fluctuations in the intensity of the fluorescence. That fluctuations actually is, uh, is a still photo capture of pumping in the lymphatic vessels. Oh, great. I love you too. Oh, OK. There we go. So yeah, you see how it's a little bit more fluorescent here than here? Uh, that's actually a snapshot of the lymphatic vessels pumping. And, uh, and this was really cool because when you look at the lymphatic, when you look at patients with lymphedema over time, so this is sort of a normal arm um, here. Oh, please, the arrow. <laughs> so this is the normal arm here, and this is a patient with very severe lymphedema. Um, you, you can see that as the lymphedema progresses, the lymphatic vessels become more and more destroyed over time. Uh, and, and actually, in the very severe forms, the lymphatic vessels are, are not there. You don't see any lymphatic vessels at all. You just see the dye in the skin itself. So really, the problem starts in the axilla, but the disease is in the arm. And, and I think that's the insight that, that Zvi taught me. And, and that's really where we got started from. And when you think about it, um, maybe lymphedema is just end organ failure of the lymphatic system. Maybe that's just fibrosis replacing the lymphatic vessels and they're not functioning anymore. Um, this sort of makes sense because lymphedema is, uh, you know, a clinical hallmark of the disease is fibrosis. This is a picture of a uh, patient, a cadaver actually, um, with their normal arm and their lymphedema arm, same patient or same person. And you can see the normal lymphatic is surrounded by a very sort of healthy looking fat and a very thin basement membrane. The lymphedematous vessels are surrounded by a thick rind of fibrous tissue. All that pink stuff is just fibrous tissue that's laid down around the vessel. And, and you can imagine that vessel is not going to work very well. This was another study where they were doing bypass surgery in patients with lymphedema. Basically, they were trying to connect the lymphatic vessels to veins to redirect the lymphatic flow. But what they showed is that as the lymphedema gets more and more severe, the lymphatic vessels tend to get more sclerotic and more fibrotic. You, you can just see that with the gross pictures, but the histologic picture shows that nicely. This hypothesis makes sense. I mean, fibrosis is a common end organ failure of every organ system that we know of. Uh, basically, every one of these organs 
you have progressive replacement of functioning parenchyma with scar tissue, and these organs eventually fail, and they don't work. And, and maybe that's what happens with lymphedema. And, and that really, the, the biology of lymphedema is actually very similar to these diseases because it's progressive. So once someone begins to have lymphedema, it tends to get worse over time if you don't do anything about it. It's unpredictable. So some people get lymphedema after a very trivial injury. You take out a sentinel lymph node, which is one or two lymph nodes, and then they get lymphedema. Other people don't get it at all. Um, some people get really bad lymphedema, like this patient here who had cervical cancer. Um, in, in a year, her leg blew up to this size. And other people, lymphedema kind of smolders along over time and doesn't really change over time. So it, it sort of fits with that fibrotic um, version of disease. And it also provides a rationale for it. So we know, for example, that radiation and obesity increase the risk of lymphedema. But both of those things also increase your risk of fibrosis, radiation directly and, and obesity indirectly. And, and maybe fibrosis, as I said, explains the, the fact that lymphedema develops eight to 10 months after surgery because this fibrotic, uh, you have to have enough fibrosis of the lymphatic system to be able to see the disease manifest itself. And so we hypothesize that lymphatic injury during surgery starts the problem. And then a series of changes happens, and you get fibrosis over time, and then some of these patients are going to develop lymphedema. And this made me interested in, uh, in the work of Thomas Wynn. Uh, he's an uh, immunologist at, uh, at the NIH uh, who's uh, done a lot of work on liver and lung fibrosis for other reasons, from other mechanisms. And he had put together this theory that a misbalance between Th1 and Th2 responses is responsible for fibrosis in these organ systems. Basically, a, a simplistic version of this is that Th2 responses cause deposition of scar tissue, decrease the uh, extracellular matrix turnover, uh, and the Th1 responses um, oppose that. And, and he had shown in a whole bunch of really nice papers that if you can diminish Th2 responses by blocking IL-4 or IL-13 or other means, then you can prevent fibrosis in the lung and the liver. And so right around this time, I had uh, Nick Clavin in the lab. Uh, Nick Clavin, um, great guy. Um, is now an attending, works in plastic surgery in North Carolina. Um, he wasn't the most organized guy, um, and, and I had asked him to run an experiment, um, and uh, a couple months go by, and I said, Nick, what happened to that experiment? He said, oh, it didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? He said, well, I didn't, you know, I did the surgery, the animals didn't get lymphedema, so I threw them out. <laughs> it turned out that Nick had actually ordered nude mice. He had ordered C57 black 6 nude mice, and, and nude mice don't have T cells. Uh, and so I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe you shouldn't have thrown them out, Nick, because, you know, I think maybe there's something to that. Um, and, and so that, that, you know, was nice to see. But that sort of launched a series of experiments in the lab. Uh, and I said, you know what, um, let's do something really simple. Just do the surgery, um, do the lymphatic uh, ablation in some animals, and then do the control where you just make the skin incision in the others, uh, and then wait six weeks until these animals have lymphedema, and, and do histology and tell me what the immune cell uh, profile of these tissues is. And what was really amazing was that the vast majority of these cells in these tissues were CD4 cells. So this is a cross-section of a mouse tail, basically we've bread loafed it. Um, you can see the muscle and the bone in the middle. Um, the skin is obviously on the outside. The white stuff in the middle is fat. And all those little brown dots are CD4 cells that we saw. And, and this was really striking in this. And of course we had access to patients. Lots and lots of patients have lymphedema. It took us a while to figure out how to study them. Uh, remember, these patients are all different ages. They've been treated with different chemotherapies. Some are premenopausal, some are postmenopausal. So there was a lot of variability between them. Uh, but what we figured out is if we use patients with unilateral lymphedema, so they have lymphedema of one arm and a normal arm of the other, we can use the normal arm as their own control. And so that's sort of a matched control. And when we did that, we, we found lots and lots of T cells in the lymphedematous arm and not so much in their normal arm. And what was really cool was that there was a direct correlation uh, between the number of T cells, uh, T helper cells, and the severity of lymphedema. So the more CD4 cells there were, they tended to have more severe lymphedema. Grade three lymphedema is worse than grade one lymphedema. And so we wrote a grant, we submitted it, and we got the review back, and you know, the, the reviewer said, well, this is really nice, but you know, it's too bad that patients don't have tails. Um, <laughs> this is really good input you get. Um, so then we developed a, a model of lymph node dissection. Uh, this is a, a popliteal lymph node dissection. Uh, we've injected uh, uh, a blue dye into the foot that gets picked up by the lymphatics. So you can see the lymph node easily, and then we remove that. And then you can see all the lymphatic fluid sort of uh, pooling up in the skin. And then remember, these, these animals don't develop lymphedema. 
uh, humans who have actually lymph node dissection or lymph node dissection don't develop lymphedema for a year, you wouldn't expect these animals to do that either. But the nice thing about this is that it's really the physiologic version of what happens. Uh, and this allows us to look at the skin, the distal foot, um, uh, sort of here, well away from the wound, and, and get an idea about what's happening with the immune profile. And, and when we did that, so we did flow cytometry in the distal uh, hind limb area. And when we did that again, same thing that we saw in our uh, histology studies. We found lots and lots of mature T cells, uh, T helper cells in the distal limb. Uh, as compared to the control animals. The control animals simply had a leg incision and no lymph node removal. So then we did the surgery in CD4 knockout mice. These mice don't have CD4 cells. And it was pretty interesting because these mice, like the nude mice, also did not develop lymphedema. So here's a CD4 knockout mice mouse six weeks after surgery. You can see that the tail is essentially normal. The wound is, he is healed essentially normally. The wild type mouse, you see how it's holding its tail in a, in a J shape? It's not holding its tail that way. It's actually fibrosed that way. Uh, it's, the fi it's the collagen tissue that's, that's laid down in the tail that's making it sit that way. And, and it's grossly swollen. So this was pretty cool. And then um, we, we came up with a way to do adoptive transfer because we wanted to see um, you know, if we can restore the phenotype. So what we did is we did the tail surgery in CD4 knockout mice. And then we injected uh, wild type um, GFP tag CD4 cells uh, into these animals to see if we can recapitulate that disease. And, and it turns out that you do. So if you simply put the CD4 cells back in, these animals develop lymphedema just like the wild type mice do. So if you deplete CD4 cells, you know, we can make the argument that uh, these transgenic mice have all kinds of other changes that may happen. They have it all their life and maybe their immune system is not normal. But we get the same same uh, effect if you deplete the CD4 cells with just antibodies. So we use neutralizing antibodies against CD4 cells. And, and again, the control animals uh, that got isotype control antibodies developed lymphedema, while the animals that were depleted of CD4 cells did not. And, and we can deplete CD8 cells, B cells, uh, and macrophages. Macrophages were depleted a different way, not with antibodies. Uh, and, and again, it didn't really change the disease. The, the macrophage story is actually a little bit more complicated than this. And if any of you are interested afterwards, I'll, I'll tell you about it. But, but it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. Depleting the CD4 uh, antibodies improves lymphatic function. This was a test that we developed based on uh, a clinical test that we have. Um, it's called lymphocytography. You inject technetium-99 into the distal tail, and then you can measure uptake in the sacral lymph nodes. Um, so the, the injection, you can see the sacral lymph nodes are just to the base of the tail, and, and you can quantify that. It's a very um, accurate and sensitive measure of lymphatic function. And if you de simply deplete the CD4 cells, you have much better lymphatic function. So the next question we had was, you know, well, how does lymphatic injury regulate naive T cell or CD4 cell differentiation? You know, does it fit with that Thomas Wynn model of, of a um, TH2 misbalance? Uh, and, and so to understand that, we did... Um, lymph node dissection in CD4 knockout mice, or we did a sham surgery where we made an incision, didn't take out the lymph nodes. And then we transfected these, we uh, adoptively transferred uh, CD4 cells, GFP-labeled CD4 cells, uh, to these mice um, from wild-type animals. And then we harvested the tissues again at four weeks. This way, we're not, we're not waiting for them to develop lymphedema. We're just waiting four weeks. Uh, and when we did the flow cytometry, it really was a mixed TH1 and TH2 response. So they had both TH1 cells and TH2 cells that were present. Now, I'm sure you guys can do much better flow cytometry than that, but we were excited about this because this was a, a nice way to show it. Um, if you do the adoptive transfer with CD4 cells from RAGO T2 mice, these mice uh, have CD4 cells that can only recognize OVA anti anti uh, antigens, um, uh, and you harvest the tissues, you don't get this response. Um, so the RAGO T2 mouse adoptive transferred cells do not infiltrate the lymphedematous tissues. That's the, that's the CD4 cells that you see here. Uh, and, and they also don't differentiate into, T, into TH2 cells. And that, and that means to me uh, that these uh, CD4 cells are actually recognizing an antigen in lymphedema. Now, what that antigen is, we don't know, know yet, but that's an area that we're working on. And then, then just to confirm things, we did the, uh, the surgery in um, mice that were uh, uh, either knocked out of Tibet. These mice can't uh, have, have a deficiency in um, generating TH1 responses because they miss in TBET, uh, or STAT6, and these mice don't generate TH2 cells. And, and again, it was really the same thing. So the mice that had a deficiency in generating TH2 cells, the TBET mice, I'm sorry, the STAT6 mice, um, ended up not developing lymphedema after six weeks of surgery. So 
we can't make knockout humans. Um, how do we translate this, you know, clinically? How, how do we translate this to a, um, a concept that we can use for patients? And, and so what we did is we, we basically did the Thomas Wynn experiments, and we wanted to know um, can we inhibit TH2 differentiation by blocking IL-4 and IL-13 in these animals? And, and if so, does that actually prevent lymphedema from developing? So we did the tail surgery, waited a couple of weeks um, because these antibodies are expensive, uh, and, and then treated them. Um, one of the reviewers that we submitted this paper asked us to do this in a rabbit. I'm like, oh, are you crazy? It's going to cost $50,000 just for the antibodies. Um, Anyway, so we waited a couple of weeks. We, we then gave them uh, IL-4 or IL-13 monoclonal antibodies or, or their respective isotype controls, and, and then we sacrificed the animals at six weeks. And what we saw is that if you block IL-4, and if I showed you this picture for IL-13, it would be the same. You can prevent lymphedema from developing uh, in these animals. So this is nice because, you know, immunotherapy is, is a potential option for patients. The bigger question, though, is can we... study that, what we did is we did the tail surgery. We then waited six weeks for the animals to develop lymphedema, and then we randomized them into two groups. Uh, one group that was treated with controls, uh, isotype antibodies, and another group that was treated with IL-4 blocking antibody, and then we sacrificed them now at nine weeks, so three weeks more than usual. Another group, we actually withdrew therapy, waited another three weeks to see if, if simply withdrawing therapy would cause the disease to come back, so that was the withdrawal treatment. So this is the animals. Um, before therapy, uh, you can see that essentially the same degree of swelling and fibrosis in both, both groups, in the IL-4 antibody-treated group and the um, control animals. And then this is the same mouse uh, three weeks after treatment with IL-4 on both pictures. So you can see the control really didn't change a lot, but treating them with the IL-4 antibody once a week for three weeks essentially made the lymphedema and the fibrosis go away. And if you withdraw uh, therapy, it doesn't come back. And that's shown graphically here. So um, before therapy, before we randomized them into two groups, the, the mice had uh, an equal amount of swelling in their tail. But with every uh, injection of IL-4 that we gave, the, the swelling came down, the fibrosis came down. And I'm not showing the histology and everything else here, but all those things got better too. So this is the, the oh, thank you. Oh, perfect. Now I can blind everyone in the audience. Um, so this is, the, this is the idea that, that we started to have, that maybe surgery initiates this problem, but then you have infiltration of CD4 cells uh, into the limb. These CD4 cells are TH2 differentiated. It's a misbalance between TH2 and TH1 responses. That causes fibrosis. And something else happens, and then they get lymphedema. And the next question was, well, what's that other thing that happens? How does, how does this response actually cause lymphedema? It, it turns out it's actually five different things. It's probably more than that. Uh, but five things we found so far, and I'll, I'll tell you about them. As we expected, um, there was a lot of lymphatic fibrosis in these animals, just like I showed you those clinical pictures. The collecting vessels, uh, shown in the top row here, uh, and the superficial vessels were surrounded by scar tissue in the control animals. All of that red stuff... Um, uh, is type 1 collagen in the figure below and alpha SMA in the figure above. And you can see that the control vessels are essentially obliterated, um, whereas if you deplete the CD4 cells, you prevent that. And you actually also prevent deposition of fibrous tissues around the superficial lymphatic vessels just underneath the skin. Another mechanism is impaired formation of collateral lymphatics. Anytime you have a lymph node dissection, uh, your, your body will automatically generate collateral vessels that then go to the next lymphatic basin. Even sometimes they cross over to the other side. So in this case, when we took out the popliteal lymph node, uh, you develop these collateral lymphatics that go to the inguinal lymph node. That's the next uh, drainage basin. And if you wait long enough, you see this in all these animals. But if you wait four weeks or so after surgery, you can see that the control animals don't have a lot of these collateral lymphatics. But if you deplete the CD4 cells, you get tons of these collateral lymphatics that form. So CD4 cells are either directly or indirectly preventing this process from happening. It, it may be that they actually have a direct effect because these Th2 uh, cytokines, and we looked at Th1 cytokines too, interferon gamma, um, um, TNF, uh, TGF-beta, which is not exactly a Th1 cytokine, but it sort of fits in, in one of these. Uh, 
Um, these cytokines actually directly inhibit lymphatic endothelial cell proliferation and function. So this is a picture of a matrigel tubule formation assay. If you take lymphatic endothelial cells, put them on matrigel, which is a 3D uh, substrate, they start making these tubules and they start proliferating and you can actually count the number of branches and the number of, um, number of branch points and, and that's a marker of their function. Uh, this is very potently blocked by recombinant uh, IL-4, recombinant IL-13. This works in vivo too. So if we do um, a corneal lymphangiogenesis assay, for example, and we treat those animals with IL-4 antibodies, you get more lymphangiogenesis. So uh, the IL-4, IL-13, also TNF-alpha and in interferon gamma uh, directly uh, prevent lymphatic vessels from growing and proliferating. And, and so what I think happens is that in lymphedema, the bad, sort of the negative regulators of, uh, of lymphangiogenesis outweigh the positive lymph uh, lymphangiogenic growth factors. Uh, and, and Although there's lots of VEGFC around, if you do an ELISA in uh, protein tissue from patients with lymphedema, there's actually more VEGFC in their arms than in, in, in patients who don't have lymphedema. So this is not a deficiency of VEGFC. It's really an overexpression of these anti-lymphangiogenic growth factors. So that's what, that's what I meant before about how VEGFC is a little bit more complicated than that. So you can dump a whole bunch of VEGFC in there, but you may not be able to overcome the problem. Another problem that we see um, in patients and also in our animals is, is uh, lymphatic leakiness. Um, and lots of different ways to show this, but the easiest way for me to show this is, is with this ICG lymphangiogram. And you can see a high-powered view of this. This is a different model that we have. In this model, we can actually ablate lymphatic vessels with diphtheria toxin. Um, uh, but this model is nice for us to be able to uh, follow the animals uh, long-term, even as long as a year. And, and you can see these punctate little areas where the lymphatic fluid is actually leaking into the skin, and that's lymphatic leakiness that happens. And both capillary and collecting lymphatics become leaky. The fellows kept on showing me um, histology of the mouse tails, uh, and, and I had asked them to do um, staining for um, INOS uh, because I, I found that the, these inflammatory cells were not um, randomly arranged. It wasn't a random increase in the number of CD4 cells, but they're really clustered around the lymphatic vessels. And, and this picture is just an example of it, but you know, I, I kept seeing this, uh, this, uh, this pattern of uh, CD4 cells arranging themselves around lymphatic vessels. The, the red is lymphatic, is the, the green or the INOS expressing cells. And, and this is pretty cool because INOS, uh, actually nitric oxide, regulates lymphatic vessel pump endogenous gradients of NOS, uh, of and ENOS, uh, generate nitric oxide, and that causes the vessels to rhythmically uh, dilate and close. Uh, when you have all this INOS around, you have tons of extra NO, or nitric oxide around, and, and that disrupts those gradients, and these vessels are dilated and not functioning very well. And, and I can show you this in this video, and, and I checked this before, and it works, so hopefully it works now. Um, this is... Um, so this is a control animal. We've injected the dye. You can see the dye accumulating here. You know, you see you see some lymphatic vessels here, but really no pumping. Now compare that with an animal that was CD4 depleted. You can easily see these vessels pumping. That this um, this video is sort of sped up over time. They don't pump that quickly, uh, but you can see that the the lymphatic uh, fluid being pumped through. We can actually calculate that and, and quantify that. We can also quantify lymphatic velocity and other things with that. So it's a really cool test. But the nice thing uh, about having this pathway is, is that we can begin to understand or think about druggable targets. Now that we know, you know, this these sequence, and it may not be exactly the sequence, and it may be, you know, the things are slightly different, or maybe there's other branch points that we're not seeing, and that this is oversimplification. Uh, but, may but maybe we can start thinking about these as druggable targets. And, and so we actually, you know, thought about um, screening a whole bunch of different compounds, and we did, and I'll, I'll show you that later. But the first idea that we did um, was, was to think about using monoclonal antibodies uh, or immunotherapy, just as it's used in other diseases like Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. Um, which are now pretty much only treated this way or, or commonly treated this way. Um, these antibodies are very well tolerated. Uh, they're very, very effective uh, and really has changed the disease management paradigm for these patients. Um, so I hunted around and I, I found that Novartis actually has a cool antibody. That's uh, two different antibodies fused together that block both IL-4 and IL-13. They'd used it in some trials on asthma. And I cold called them and I, not surprisingly, I couldn't get through. Uh, 
it turned out that I actually had a patient who worked at Novartis, and she introduced me to the chief medical officer, who then reluctantly agreed to talk to me. And then, uh, so I, I talked to him, and I, he invited me to drive up to, to Cambridge, which is where they're located. And I, and I went to Cambridge, and I showed him our, our mouse uh, stuff, and they were interested. So we, we decided to do an uh, investor-initiated clinical trial, a, a very small study, um, open label, so not placebo or randomized or anything like that. Uh, 22 patients uh, with unilateral breast cancer-related lymphedema, and at the time, um, I had done a I'd done a um, uh, sort of pilot study, and we found out that the minimum difference that I can tell within within volume is about 75 cc. And so, you know, being super smart, uh, I decided that oh, we should make the volume differential as a as our inclusion criteria 400 cc's, which is, in retrospect is a very bad idea, but I'll show you that. And, and then we treated the patients with a once-a-month injection of this antibody uh, for four months. Then we withdrew the treatment uh, for another four-month period, the half-life of the antibody, and we call that the washout period. And so our objectives were safety. We wanted to know this treatment was safe and Multiple measurements along the arm and calculates the volume of the arm with a truncated colon formula. And then we measured quality of life using a, a validated survey and some histology. Um, I sent the protocol up to our IRB, and they sent it back. They said, you know, these patients are going to get cancer, and forget it, you're not doing it. So then I went back and looked at all the literature, and it actually turns out that uh, blocking TH2 responses is good for treating cancer. Uh, breast tumors, for example, are infiltrated by TH2 cells, and these TH2 cytokines, because they're immunosuppressive, uh, actually promote tumor growth and suppress immune responses to the tumor. In fact, some people have suggested that uh, blocking this TH2 response would be a way to treat patients who are uh, failing other treatments. So we got past that hurdle. And then we got the trial started. And this is the adverse events. Um, a lot of them were sort of nonspecific things. Uh, we did have one patient develop pulmonary mets uh, about a year after our treatments. Uh, but she, was, she had very uh, advanced or um, uh, aggressive breast cancer. She had an inflammatory breast cancer, probably not unexpected. We had one patient who developed cellulitis during the course of treatment, but she had had cellulitis before, and you know who knows if it was from the treatment or not. Uh, either way, we had to exclude both patients from analysis, and then we ran out of the drug, so we only had drug for available to study in eight patients. The, 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 it's very expensive to make the drug, and it didn't make sense for them to make uh, more drug for just 13 more patients. And, and we were very disappointed that there was no difference in, in the arm volume measurements. This is a a graph showing you the, the volume between the patients uh, before therapy, after therapy, and after washout. Really, there was not a whole lot of difference uh, among them. Uh, the important thing, though, is that if you can, if you can look at it, the, the average volume differential was 750 cc's, which is a lot. And, and I think in, in my um, desire to be sort of you know, smart and having better uh, and more powerful you know, statistical power, uh, I self-selected for patients who had very advanced stage lymphedema. This is a, a gross picture, and I'm sorry, uh, but it sort of proves the point a little bit. Um, this is a cross-section through a cadaver specimen. This is a, this is a lower limb, um, normal on one side and lymphedema on the other side. And you can see that in the lymphedema specimen, uh, th there's a ton of fat that's deposited there. Uh, and, and even the muscle is different. And so probably uh, the way I interpret this is there's probably there's not time enough for a four-month therapy to reverse these sort of very chronic changes. And at, at some point, maybe it's just like liver cirrhosis or other things where it's not reversible by, by medication. So I, I think that's, what, that's how I self-selected these patients. Fortunately, we did do um, a um, quality of life questionnaire. Um, the ULL27 is a um, quality of life questionnaire for lymphedema. There's lots of them out there. Um, the reason why I picked this one is because it has a short look back period. So it basically asks patients to think about their physical, social, and psychological symptoms, and they, and they sort of outline them over a four week period. So, how did you feel about this four weeks ago? And, and this test, unlike some other tests, was designed specifically to test the efficacy of some therapies. The, the, the people who made this were physical therapists that were looking at the efficacy of uh, physical therapy for lymphedema, but this allowed us to look at drug treatment effects too. And a higher score is, is better quality of life. And what was really interesting is that um, five out of our eight patients had uh, a lot of improvements in their physical and social scales. Um, some patients did not. Now, this could all be placebo. We did not randomize these patients. You know, they, they, they all knew they were getting drugs, so maybe this is all placebo effect. 
But when we looked at the, the washout period, they basically all went back to normal. So pretreatment for the physical score, and this is questions like the arm feels heavy or it's swollen or it's hard, uh, difficulty with dressing or sleeping or grasping. Those are the types of questions that are in there. Their pretreatment score is 57. After treatment, it went to 70, and that, that was significant. And then it went back to 59 after we had stopped treating them out. Again, this is not you know, good study design. This does not mean anything. It could simply be a placebo effect, because they also knew they weren't getting the drug. But at least it's a start. And, and we saw a very similar picture with the social changes. Um, this is questions about looking at themselves in the mirror, um, patients doing things that they like to do, like going outside and taking advantage of the good weather, and hobbies and projects. And again, we saw the same pattern. Psychological didn't change, and I think psychological didn't change probably because those psychological things are harder to change. Once you have those changes you have, it's much more difficult for a very short treatment effect to do that. And, and so how do I reconcile this difference between quality of life and, and the changes that we saw in arm volume? You know, I think some of it is related to fluid versus fat. Uh, this is an MRI of a lower extremity. Um, I like showing lower extremity because it's easier to show them side by side. And both of these patients, two different patients, have the same amount of swelling in their legs. Uh, one person has more fat than fluid. The, the dark stuff is fluid. And one person has all fat. And, and I think that we can probably um, uh, make, an, uh, make a difference in the patients who have more fluid in their leg or in their arm than patients who have gone on to deposit all this fat. And that, that's sort of the theory that we have. And, and, and this is actually the, the kind of think that, thinking that we do for our patients who we treat surgically, which I'll tell you about. We also did some um, biopsy specimens on these patients. We took a, I don't know why the artist drew it this big, but uh, uh, after the fifth revision, I sort of got tired of sending it back and forth, but and we, we accepted this. But, but these were five millimeter biopsies, so it's teeny tiny biopsies. The patients don't get um, infections from it. We've done it over 200 times, um, so we've not had a problem with it, so it's safe. Uh, but the nice thing is it allows us to look at what happens in, in the change in the skin. And one of the things that we know is the hallmark of lymphedema is hyperkeratosis. Um, and you can see that a little bit better here. Um, that's the thickness of the keratinocyte layer uh, in, in normal lymphedema. And, and when we looked at the thickness comparing their control arm with the lymphedematous arm, this was significantly different. But then after treatment, uh, that difference went away. So we were able to decrease the hyperkeratosis, and maybe that sort of contributed to the symptoms as well. And a lot of this was related to keratinocyte proliferation. So when we looked at KI67 staining in the keratinocyte layer, uh, before treatment, there was lots of proliferating keratinocytes uh, in the lymphedematous arm and, and not so much in the normal arm. After treatment, the, the number of per, uh, proliferating keratinocytes went down a lot. So this was the summary of the clinical trial. Um, the, the trial was safe and I think well tolerated. Uh, we did have some improvements in quality of life and histologic changes, but no differences in arm volume. And I think that's probably related to the differences in the, in the severity of the disease. And I think in the future, uh, probably preventative trials or trials on patients with earlier stage lymphedema may, may be more effective. Now, uh, I can't emphasize to you how painful it was to do these infusions um, uh, for us and also the patients because they had to go to the infusion center. Um, they had to sit there for four hours uh, after they got the infusion. Um, they had to be monitored uh, while they're getting the infusion. Because although we know that immunotherapy in general is safe, some patients can have anaphylactic reactions and other things, and we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. And so right around that time, I, I started to think, well, why can't we treat this with a topical drug? Um, the, the lymphatic vessels that we're trying to get to are really not that far down. This is, the, this is the epidermis, the keratinocyte layer. This is the dermis. Here's the lymphatic vessels. So they're just below the dermis. The, all the inflammatory cells that we see are, are right there. Why can't we just treat these patients with a topical drug and simply not um, expose them to the systemic exposure? And so I had gone to a conference uh, where one of my colleagues was talking about um, hand transplantation. They do hand transplants for patients who've had an amputation. And they were treating their patients with topical tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is an anti-rejection drug uh, that we use for liver and kidney and transplants and things like that. But they were using topical tacrolimus uh, to, to, to treat this. Um, and then I found out that topical tacrolimus is also commonly used for things like psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, and eczema. And basically, tacrolimus is an old drug. It's been around forever. Uh, it's an IL-2 inhibitor, uh, so it prevents uh, T cell proliferation, not T2 cells, but all T cell proliferation. Uh, and, and it was available. So it's FDA approved, and, and we can use it. Um, so it seemed like a good idea. And so we did the same 
kind of experiment, as, as I told you, with IL-4. We did the mouse tail surgeries. Um, this time we waited three weeks because the, the fellows uh, were going to revolt about doing uh, tacrolimus treatment once a day for, for three weeks. So we did two weeks of, uh, of, of once a day treatment. Um, and, and then we did the sacrifice. And then we did our treatment for established lymphedema. Again, we waited six weeks till the animals had lymphedema and then treated them with tacrolimus. And, and it turns out that tacrolimus is actually very effective as a preventative drug. So. Uh, when we treat the animals uh, with tracolimus um, before they develop lymphedema, the, the tail swelling goes away and doesn't come back. So if I follow this out another three weeks, they, they stay fine. Um, it's not as good for treatment of lymphedema once it's become established, but it still works. So this difference was uh, highly statistically significant, but they never went back to normal, even with the with the, um, sort of three weeks treatment. And the nice thing is that the topically applied tacrolimus does not absorb systemically. If we treat a patient with uh, a liver transplant tacrolimus, we have to check their uh, uh, blood FK506 levels. FK506 is the other name for tacrolimus because it's nephrotoxic and immunosuppressive. Uh, but as you can see, the, the topical version uh, was not really uh, absorbed systemically, certainly not in the immunosuppressive range. This was animals that we treated with uh, intraperitoneal tacrolimus. And, and it was very effective at, at decreasing the CD4 response. Um, CD4 generation of uh, collateral lymphatics, uh, lymphatic pumping. That's a graph showing you the pumping. Uh, and so really improve lymphatic function along those five different mechanisms that I've showed you. So what's the role of surgery? Um, for a while, I didn't actually think there was a whole lot. Uh, but then I started to think about it a little bit more. Um, and, and you can think of, and even surgery sort of fits in the scheme that we have. There's really two types of surgery that we do. Um, one type of surgery that we do is called physiologic procedures. Physiologic procedures aim to reverse the lymphatic injury that happened. So we do a lymph node transplant to try and get the lymphatic vessels to reconnect. Or we do a lymphovenous bypass to redirect the lymphatic fluid from the, from the lymphatic system into the venous system and avoid the area of injury. Or we do reductive procedures. Reductive procedures essentially just remove all that fat that's been deposited. The most common version of that that I do is liposuction. Um, we do a lot of uh, lymph node transplants. Um, this is a picture of a, a diagram of it. Essentially, we have a, a, piece of, uh, a piece of tissue with lymph nodes in it together with an artery and a vein. We disconnect those from the area that we get it from. It's really just like a any other transplant, except instead of donating it to somebody else, you're donating it to another part of your body. And so we reconnect the blood vessels. The lymphatic vessels are too small for us to connect, but these form on the, these reconnect spontaneously. Um, and I'm showing you the different areas that we get the lymphatics from. Uh, we used to do a lot of lymphatics from the groin area, but that we were always worried about causing lymphedema in the leg that we get the lymph nodes from. So now we take the lymphatics from around the stomach. The, the omentum actually has a lot of lymph nodes in it. Anyway, the, the bottom line is that if you do this, um, here's an MRI of a patient post-op, and you can see that cluster of lymph nodes that we transferred. They're alive. But more importantly, these lymph nodes actually take up, uh, they're functional. So they take up uh, technetium-99 that was injected in the leg. Uh, and you can see that in that, uh, in that red circle. So these lymphatics have reestablished the circulation to the native leg. Uh, and they are able to uh, filter um, bacteria and other things and also pick up lymphatic fluid. And, and some of our patients get better. We, we're not smart enough yet to know exactly who gets better and who gets worse. But patients who have early stage disease tend to do better than those who have late stage disease, as, as one would expect. But this patient had sort of moderate stage uh, lymphedema of her um, right leg after a gynecologic procedure. And, and the scar there is where we put the lymph nodes. Uh, so these are extra anatomic lymph nodes. You don't ordinarily have lymph nodes there. Um, and, and she got much better at a year post-op. This is a, a very severe case. Um, this, this woman had um, a radical mastectomy. So they removed the pectoralis muscle. That's why you see all those ribs there. Uh, she had tremendous amount of scarring and um, uh, really r limited range of motion in her arm. This is about as much as she can lift her arm. So she really came to us not so much for lymphedema, but because of all this contracture in her arm. Um, and ordinarily, I wouldn't operate on someone with this severe lymphedema. But because she was so, uh, this was so morbid for her, we decided to do it. Anyway, we did a big surgery. We removed all that scar tissue from the armpit. And I won't show you those pictures. Um, and replaced it with good, healthy skin, but also skin that had some lymph nodes in it. Uh, and she actually got much better afterwards. And I think a lot of it was simply releasing all that scar tissue in the, in the armpit. So 
I, I don't think that surgery and, and medicine are two separate things. I actually think that they actually go together. Um, so we treat cancers with surgery and chemotherapy, uh, and, and I think that the same is probably going to be end up true for lipedema surgery. So I think that some of these methods that we have are uh, things that we understand would probably make lymphatic regeneration in the, um, in the patients who get lymph node transplant better. What are we doing now? We want to know how the T cells are activated, and I sort of touched on that a little bit. Um, I think that the keratinocytes actually play, play a big role. This is a, um, a segment of skin uh, that's been stained for uh, TSLP and um, IL-13. And, um, uh, and you can see, and the really cool thing is that I think that these TH2 initiating things are happening at the layer of the skin. And I, and I think that a breakdown in, in skin barrier function may, may cause that. So that's one of the areas that we're working in. And um, we want to know. Um, how uh, lymphatic vessels actually interact with fat, and of course our drug development idea, which we're, we're working on actively. So, you know, I think I've shown you that T cells play a, a key role in the pathology of lymphedema. Um, it, it's nice to know these mechanisms, because once you know these mechanisms, you can know, you know, what drugs are available and how you can intervene, how you can translate these ideas clinically. And so, you know, a lot of my plastic surgery colleagues would say, you know, that's great, you have a CD4 knockout mice that doesn't have lymphedema, that's fantastic. What does that mean, and how do you clinically translate that? Well, that's how you clinically translate it. You get this basic information, and, and you can make a, adjustments based on that. And, and I think, and I'm hoping that this, this idea is a paradigm change from, uh, for lymphedema therapy. And I'm not talking about compression stockings. I'm talking about this whole obsession with dumping a lot of VEGFC or uh, HGF and other things in, in these patients, because I, I don't think those, those methods are going to work, and I think um, at, at worst they're going to make them much more susceptible to breast cancer recurrence and, and all the problems. Um, lots and lots and lots of people, you know, contributed to this. A um, lot of postdocs um, got tortured uh, along the years. Uh, my collaborators and our funding. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. And, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. off their hormones, right? So they undergo oh. hormone ablation quite suddenly. And uh, estrogen signaling has been implicated in all kinds of areas that you talked about, namely um, fat differentiation. So differentiation of cells into fat cells um, is inhibited by estrogen. Yeah. Um, nitric oxide in the vasculature is, is estrogen receptor dependent for rapid signaling for estrogen receptors in the membrane of endothelial cells. Um, and, and also estrogen and progesterone play a really big role in, in infiltration of immune types of cells into tissues, not just the breast. And so I'm wondering if any of the pathology in the women who get this severely and the women who don't, is any epidemiological evidence available for those who were already postmenopausal when diagnosed and hormone levels were kind of low and those who had high hormone levels? I mean, is there any, like if you rip someone off of estrogen right away, I mean, maybe these things become more severe. Is that known at all? Did you read my grant? I think you read my grant. <laughs> uh, no, I did not. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an aim too. Um, yeah, you're right, uh, 100%. The, um, so th there's actually a couple of studies out there. The problem with these studies is, is that it's hard for them to control for everything that happens. Uh, but it definitely suggests that um, estrogen inhibitors increase the risk of lymphedema. So patients on tamoxifen and other things have a higher risk of lymphedema. And, and I think that... Um, uh, you're right. I think that the estrogens are actually protective. I think that INOS, in addition to changing the um, pumping, uh, I think it generates free radicals and, and actually injures the lymphatics. That's one of the things we're working on. And, and I think that estrogen is protective of that. Um, the, um, the, the, the whole issue of weight gain and you know, chronic sort of tissue inflammation also helps. I, I didn't show you this, but we have lots and lots of data to show that, uh, that fat and lymphatics actually um, work together, uh, and um, there's a linear relationship between increasing weight gain and, um, lymphatic, and decreasing lymphatic function, uh, and, and really removing someone ab abruptly off estrogen does that. You know, you know, it's a common myth. All my patients think that, oh, I'm going to get chemo, I'm going to lose weight. You know, that's going to be the great thing, but it, that actually does not work. Um, almost every patient who I've ever known with, um, who's been treated with chemotherapy has gained weight, and, and I think a big part of it is this estrogen withdrawal. When we do our obesity studies, um, 
if we give male mice a high fat diet, they all get fat. If we get female mice a high fat diet, they don't get fat, unless we take their ovaries out or unless we give them an estrogen blocker. So it really does help, and I think it's a big part of this, and so I think you're right. Are there changes in the lymphatic endothelial cells in your mouse model in the, uh, you know, yeah. in the so, mice that get it? Um, yeah, we, I didn't show that. It, it's, it just takes a little too, time, too long to describe, but we've done, um, uh, we'll do sorting of the, of the LEX, uh, so you can actually sort out the lymphatic endothelial cells and the blood endothelial cells by um, uh, doing sorting for protoplanin and CD31. Cells that are protoplanin positive, CD31 positive, are lymphatic endothelial cells. Those that are protoplanin negative, CD31 positive, are blood endothelial cells. And then you can do PCR on that. Uh, and if we do that, um, the really interesting thing is that the expression of VEGF receptor 3 in the LEX is way down regulated. Um, so they, they have um, a, a much lower expression of VEGF receptor 3. And I think that's one of the mechanisms by which they become insensitive to VEGFC. You can dump as much VEGFC as you want, but they're just not seeing it. Um, uh, in fact, we made another mouse. I'll show you a picture. Um, we made a mouse in which we knocked out, um, we knocked out a, uh, a P10 intracellularly, so they become independent of VEGF receptor 3, and when you do that, you can actually increase their lymphatic endothelial cell proliferation a lot. So this is, this is a mouse that we developed for that reason, uh, because of this VEGFC resistance idea. And then just one comment, this is kind of from left field, but I was just at a meeting. Tom Gajewski from the University of Chicago was looking at patients that responded or did not respond to checkpoint blockade inhibition among uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients. And what he found was that there was almost 100% correlation with their microbiota. And so he doesn't know what's going on, but they're identifying which are the key components that you know are present in the responders versus the non-responders. So that just popped into mind because in the beginning of your talk, you said you don't know who's gonna develop it and who won't. Right, So, right. yeah. No, that's a really cool idea. Uh, we were talking about this last night. Okay. So. Um, no, but go ahead. No, no, that was it. That was the. Yeah, that I, was the you only know, I think I, I have to, I have to, um, I have to get my act together and find a uh, pathogen-free um, uh, uh, lab or um, animal care facility and, and, and study that because I think you know one of our big ideas is that these bacterial particles are generating these self autoreactive T cells, and I think that that's important. Uh, we we happen to not have a uh, pathogen-free. Um, animal care facility, but I'm pretty sure that Rockefeller does. So, you know, it just means that I got to go track someone down and, and make them listen to me and, you know, torture them to, to, to agree to do this. In your topical application of the IL-12 inhibitor and the animals, you saw that in the, in the case where you were trying to look at the reversal of disease, there was not a complete reversal. Do you think that could be a possible delivery? Like, it's like you're depending on the infusion of the material basically into the lymphatics versus, you know, maybe you can use more directed uh, conduction-based kind of delivery to get it closer because of the end stage, maybe it's more like more fat deposits and more fibrotic that can prevent the diffusion of the... Yeah, inhibitor. I'm not sure if it's diffusion. I, I didn't show you, but we actually treated some animals with systemic PACRO too. So there was a group that got systemic PACRO. In fact, the topical PACRO was more effective. Um, so I, I'm not sure if it's diffusion or not. Um, I think you know. I think at some point you do um, develop these changes, which are which are chronic, and, and they're much more difficult to reverse. Um, it would be interesting to do that long-term experiment, even more long-term. So treat them for you know four to six weeks after. Uh, and we actually have you know I, I sort of touched on this very briefly, but we have the diphtheria toxin model, which is nice. Um, I think I put a picture right in here somewhere. Um, this is why I do this. Uh, the diphtheria toxin model is nice because uh, if we ablate the lymphatics in the hind limb with, um, uh, with DT, these, these mice only express diphtheria toxin in their lymphatic endothelial cells. So just one little injection wipes out the entire lymphatic vessel. Uh, and these mice get lymphedema forever. So they, don't, they, they never get better. Um, and, and so using these animals, we can test the, that, those ideas and, and treat them for longer. Part of the problem with the tail model is that at some point, they start to get better on their own. And, and so it becomes more and more difficult to tell the difference between the control animals and the treated animals. So somewhere around 12 weeks, they start, they start getting better. Since um, patients with lymphedema are at higher risk for bacterial infections causing cellulitis, what do you think about tacrolimus' effect in that context? 
can you model the cellulitis in your mouse yeah. model? Yeah, we, so we have, um, we have um, a few studies that we've done on, um, uh, on why um, these patients are, are more sort of susceptible. Uh, it turns out that a lot of those CD4 cells are actually Tregs. That they're not just Th1 or Th2. There's tons of Tregs in there. Um, and if you uh, deplete Tregs, we have a Treg DT mouse. And if you deplete Tregs, you can actually make their immune responses better. So, for example, if you immunize a animal after axillary lymph node dissection or popliteal lymph node dissection, they don't they don't generate as many antibodies, anti ovar antibodies, for example. Um, if you um, if you expose them to a um, uh, an antigen, for example, they also don't have T cell responses uh, or, or um, the allergic T cell responses. And so they're, both their T and B cell responses are lowered. And, and also, if you look at their dendritic cells and their macrophages, they have fewer uh, markers of activation on them than they don't. If you deplete the Tregs, th those changes get better. Um, they clear bacteria better to their, uh, to their remaining lymph nodes, so they actually cross over to the other side. So I think the Tregs play a, a part of this immunosuppressive response. They're trying to really damp down this you know, chronic inflammatory reaction, but in doing so, they're making some patients more susceptible. It's much, I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. Every time I, I think that I figured something out, you know, five new things pop up and, uh, and surprise us. Um, so I, I'm certain that it's more complicated than that, but I think that the Tregs play a role in that. All right, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bye-bye.